Hi, I'm Casey. Welcome to my talk, Debugging Your Brain. Uh, before we jump into the topic, I'm going to introduce myself. I live in DC. This is DuPont Circle, where I sometimes host bubble parties when we're not in a pandemic. I miss it. I can play an instrument in every color. At least I can play Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. That's my bench benchmark for myself. Uh, you can see me dancing there at the bottom, um, dressed up as a pirate, playing bass drum. This is very me. I love to teach. There's me at the top teaching Intro to Programming at Yale University from a long time ago now. And on the bottom you see me at a meetup in DC teaching Electron. Uh, I may assign homework during this, as my teacherisms might show. I've worked in tech for 10 years including recently at USCIS, working on immigration, and at Heroku. I've been a product manager, an engineering manager, an engineer, and I've worked in a whole bunch of sectors, too. I studied neurobiology at Yale University, and I'm co-author in a few papers. They're not related to today's talk in particular, but I thought you might be interested in a little taste of the science language you have to use in this field. I wrote a book about this talk, actually. I've been giving this talk for five years, different forms of it, always getting better, and then I finally sat down and turned it into a book so that I could reach more people with the content and the techniques that I want to share. Lately, I'm working on turning that book into a board game because it's very practical and hands-on, all the techniques. Uh, so I'm working on a mental framework of how to process your experiences with cards and tokens. All right, we'll do a, a quick little intro section before I give you the roadmap of the talk. Anxiety versus excitement. If you've ever given a presentation like this in public, you probably feel one or the other. Uh, they're physiologically similar. You could be anxious or excited and have the same set of physiological uh, experiences. Physiological arousal is a term for a bunch of the overlap, including increased heart rate, which I probably have now, whether I'm anxious or excited, dilated pupils, talking fast, which takes a lot of practice not to do when given presentations like this. I'm definitely inclined to talk fast, and I'm trying not to. Whether it's excitement or anxiety is depends a lot on which outcome is expected. If you expect a bad outcome, you'll probably feel anxious. But if you expect a good outcome, you might feel excited. Often, we don't know whether the outcome is going to be good or bad. There's a big uncertain chunk in the middle. And by default, humans tend to be anxious if you're uncertain about the outcome. We tend to focus on what could go wrong. And usually, most possible outcomes, uh, we don't know. We're uncertain how it's going to turn out. We just don't know unless we've done the same thing over and over. So most people presenting feel much more anxious than excited, at least the first times. But with this trick, reframing, uh, you could be more excited. So instead of focusing on what could go wrong, like I could say something uh, wrong, I could stumble over my speech and waste seconds of my presentation time, uh, I could focus instead about what can go right. Like if I have an impact on someone listening to this talk and they learn something valuable. And I think you'll learn a lot of valuable things. I think a lot of audience members will. And when I start focusing on what positive impact I'm having, I get much more excited and less anxious. <laughs> so my uncertainty in the middle, I'm focusing on all those positives and it gets so much brighter uh, when I do that reframing trick. I'm excited to be talking to you all here. Thanks for coming. Right, in this talk, uh, half the talk is going to be framing, like grounding topics, and then the other half will be concrete techniques you can use. Uh, we'll start with some example challenging experiences you can use to go through, uh, to use these techniques on. Then we'll talk about the inner versus outer brain, which is a useful dichotomy when processing experiences. We'll have you model the brain like a system in the kind of way programmers tend to do. And then I'll explain the 
uh, big ideas of cognitive behavioral therapy, which the techniques are uh, largely based on. So starting with the challenging experiences. So challenging experience, um, by that I mean one where you might experience a downward spiral of negative thoughts leading to negative feelings, leading to more negative thoughts, and just feel worse and worse and worse. Uh, by the way, I made that in Blender last month. I'm very proud. Another term uh, is rumination. Uh, the definition for this was really interesting when I looked it up finally. Rumination is focusing on the causes and consequences of a bad situation. It's like the negative stuff in the past and the negative stuff in the future. Instead of uh, the, the solutions, the positive future that you might be able to get. Uh, ruminating is often counterproductive because you're just downward spiraling often. And the, the way out of rumination is what we'll cover this whole talk. All right, let's have some examples of challenging experiences. For one, uh, having an argument at work. If you have an idea how to solve a problem, but your coworker has a different idea, you might get heated. You might really uh, butt heads on it, and that could be very stressful. And then you could potentially think negative thoughts and feel negative feelings and feel worse about it and say, I shouldn't have said that. If only they weren't so something or other. Anyway, that, that's an example. Hopefully it's relatable to a bunch of you. Second example. If you're a parent, you might accidentally snap at your kids sometime when they frustrate you. Uh, and then you might potentially downward spiral thinking, I'm such a bad parent. Why would I say that? I wish I hadn't. Uh, like, it could make you feel worse and worse. For a third example, uh, this one I'll dig into a, a later in this talk. I was going to a meetup and I was hangry, hungry and angry both. I was wet because it was raining and I was running late and I thought all sorts of negative thoughts. I have a couple of activities. I'm going to cut most of them out for this format, but this one I do want us to do. In the chat sidebar, please come up with five challenging experiences of your own from the past month when you had or almost had a downward spiral. I have some ideas here for like topic areas if you'd like. Uh, if you are comfortable sharing, please do. If not, you can write them down on your own. I'll set a timer for three minutes, and this will be what you'll think about as we go through the rest of the presentation. Three minutes, start. Right, for time, I want to cut it a little shorter than I said. Uh, 30 more seconds. Feel free to share what you have as you go if you'd like. All right, and time. Thanks for sharing some challenging experiences in the side.
you didn't get a chance yet, go ahead and read through to see what other people are thinking. All right, so those challenging experiences are what you'll use these techniques on. Uh, next, I'm going to go through two different mental models you can use, the universe outer brain and system modeling of the brain. Inner outer brain. This GIF demonstrates pretty well. This cat turns around, sees a potential threat, and jumps away from it. And then I like to imagine a moment later the cat investigated and discovered that it's just a cucumber. So there are two uh, levels of reaction here. The fast one, the jump out of the way, and the slower investigation. That fast part happens inside the inner brain. Emotions tend to happen there, and the path, as you can see drawn on the brain, is much shorter. The thought path has to go a lot farther. Uh, it's like the scale of milliseconds on the left and the scale of seconds on the right. It's like a huge difference. Specifically, the inner brain is often called the limbic system. It's the older part of the brain. More animals have it. Fewer animals have the cortex, the outer brain. Roughly speaking, feelings happen in that inner brain, and they're faster than thoughts, which happen in the outer brain, that are much slower. That's probably intuitive, but uh, there are some interesting takeaways, like when you have a feeling and a thought, which one came first? Often the feeling came first even if you uh, maybe think the other way around. All right, we're skipping that one. So that's the inner versus outer brain, fast and slow, thoughts and feelings. Next up is system modeling the brain. As software developers, you probably think about functions a lot. These have an input, they do something, and they have an output. They return a value. Uh, this is the simplest model of a system, is something that has an input, a process, and an output. It's called the input process output model, the IPO model. Sometimes you also incorporate a feedback loop from the output to the input. Uh, applied to psychology, a simple one is uh, characterized by Pavlov's experiment where he rang a bell when feeding a dog, and the dog learned the bell meant food was coming. And then uh, he noticed when he rang the bell, the dog salivated in anticipation of food, even if there was no food present. So that was an association. Uh, it can be modeled in a very simple way. There's an input, the bell, and the output, which is the salivation. And he even measured how many milliliters of saliva the dog produced to see how strong the correlation was. Like, this is empirical. We like to think in general that humans, we aren't just input-output machines. We actually think and the thinking changes the output, the things that we do to the world, and that happens in this middle part of the IPO model, the process. Uh, but of course, we humans aren't always so thoughtful. <laughs> Sometimes we are just input-output machines, like that animal model we just described. And often, animals probably do think. We, don't, we can't ask them, they can't tell us, but if they have the cerebral cortex, it's very possible. Uh, anyway, often humans are on autopilot and habits run things. It's not really in your control. Uh, but we can flip to a mindful state, and then we're in more manual control of how we respond to those inputs. Uh, so, in summary, autopilot is when our habits are in control, and then we're just simple input-output. There's not much control in the middle. And when we're mindful, that's what this is what the word means to me, is it's when we can influence things in the middle there. We can respond to our inputs according to how we think we should, instead of just doing it. All right, so that's my systems model of the brain, input-output model, and defining the word mindful. Next, I'll explain cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, CBT is the nickname for that. CBT treats many mental illnesses, so many, in fact, that it's maybe more interesting to list ones it doesn't treat. In undergrad psychology, it was the most common answer on every test. If I wasn't sure, I could just say CBT. And I often got a lot of points for that. CBT is just uh, very powerful. It's not necessarily the best or most effective therapy for everything, but it is helpful for so many mental illnesses. Uh, for one example, for treating depression, 
Some studies show that CBT is just as effective as antidepressant drugs. Uh, the combination might be even more powerful, so I'm not saying this is, um, I'm not suggesting anything you do or don't do, but it's very powerful. Talk therapy alone is can be as powerful as antidepressant drugs. And the talk therapy skills you get kind of stay with you forever. <laughs> In a lot of ways, that's more powerful. All right, you might be wondering, why are you talking about therapy? I am not someone who needs therapy. Uh, there's a stigma around therapy still, for sure. Uh, but the, the skills from CBT apply to really everyone. I would reframe CBT to be cognitive behavioral training. And if that helps make it more pal palatable to you, that's great. Uh, these skills should be learned by everyone. All right, so what are the techniques? Uh, a lot of these are from CBT. A couple of them are my own anyway. Some are from DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. This is my synthesis of the biggest ideas, the core ideas that I want you to take away from these. We'll go through these in order. Uh, introspection is kind of like hitting your debugger breakpoint so you can see what's going on in the first place. Identifying inputs is kind of like becoming aware of what the inputs to your function are and what any local variables are that you have to work with. Verbalizing experiences. Uh, so in the mind, if you can describe it, it's much easier to manipulate and work with and understand. Uh, and then validation. It's kind of what it sounds like in programming, too. Like, make sure the thing is right. And often this is done with someone else. So if someone else tells you that makes sense, you can have much higher confidence than if you try to convince yourself that you do make sense. And then lastly, there are some thought patterns that get in the way that aren't helpful. Uh, cognitive distortions, we call them. But you can counter those with cognitive restructuring. All right, we'll go through each of these in depth, starting with introspection. I'll tell you a story about a time when it helped my mom to introspect. So she had a problem. My little brother had left the door open again, and she was very frustrated about it and yelled. But then she felt bad and wanted us to catch catch this kind of thing next time. So it happened again, maybe a week later. She got very frustrated about it. Uh, and then we all went, whoop! We yelled whoop at her, and that helped her realize she didn't want to have this kind of stressed uh, lash out response. She wanted to take a moment and think about it. So she entered the whoop state. She became mindful. Uh, she decided to take a moment, figure out what her inputs were, to process them and all that. And this is huge. This is amazing. Like, if you can take a moment in the middle of a frustrating situation to step back, if you can get good at that, you can really change the course of a lot of uh, events in your life, a lot of situations. By doing the whoop, you're basically switching modes from the habit autopilot mode down into the mindful manual mode, switching gears. Once you're there, you might or may not know what to do, but I want you to celebrate any time you notice you should or would like to get into this whoop state to become mindful. If you just notice that it's an opportunity to do it and you go whoop, that's a moment for celebration. All right, skipping that technique. All right, uh, identifying inputs is next. So when you enter the whoop, it helps to take stock of what you've got to work with here. There are four inputs we'll go through and two non-inputs, two things that you do have control over. Two of the inputs are your automatic thoughts and automatic feelings. To illustrate this, imagine you just stubbed your toe and you thought, crap, ow, that hurt. The automatic thought might have been all those curse words you thought in your head. The automatic feeling might be frustration, maybe anger, a whole bunch of feeling words there. And you didn't decide to think those thoughts or to feel those feelings. They just happened to you. Your conscious mind gets that as an input to work with. Your conscious mind can choose what thoughts to respond with, though. I'd call those deliberate thoughts, ones that you chose to think. You can say, I should move that piece of furniture, or something like that. Maybe, maybe you think that deliberately. And if you think deliberate thoughts that change the way you feel, you could say that those are influenced feelings. So that's within your control some amount, too. All right, what are the other two inputs? Thoughts and feelings is everything, right? Kind of. Uh, another category is external stimuli. So like the fact that, that the furniture was there for your foot to stub on, or the disagreement at work, or stuff happening in the news, all these external stimuli, they're real inputs. 
uh, and to treat them as such is helpful. The fourth category is bodily state. So this is kind of none of the other three. My favorite word to explain bodily state is hangry. This is a portmanteau, a combination of two words that makes a new word. Uh, hunger and anger. Put them together, it's hangry. I wish we had more words like that. I think this is super useful. I'm thrilled that people have vocabulary to describe how your bodily state affects uh, your emotional state. So once I get into a whoop state, when I'm in this mindful uh, position, I like to take stock of all of these types of inputs and just treat them as data. Try not to judge them, try not to be upset at myself for automatically thinking them or automatically feeling them, because I didn't choose to do that. They happened to me. Uh, I would do an activity here. I just want to say to do this later. Um, for one of your situations, try to go through and find something in each of those four categories. And the categories aren't strict. I don't. You don't need to decide each word or statement you write down which one it is. This just helps you brainstorm and make sure you get the full breadth of things. Like for my mom, the fact that she was hangry was a big factor in why she was frustrated with my brother. And if she had missed that, she may have focused on some thoughts and feelings instead. She'd be missing out on a big chunk of it. All right, that was identifying inputs. Next up, verbalizing experiences, uh, or processing. Yeah, verbalizing is a great way to process them. I'm going to go through six techniques with you. By the way, I drew these, and I'm proud, even if they're not beautiful, because uh, they're <laughs> not licensed. I can use them however I want. Uh, one technique. Technique one is to expand your emotional vocabulary. Uh, so when you're writing out your thoughts or trying to think about how to describe it, it helps to have nuanced emotional vocabulary words to do so. There's a bunch of references that I have here. Uh, I'll show you some examples. This is just a chart giving uh, like synonyms that are more nuanced for each of the main feelings. Here, a bunch of those words are in a visual, seeing how they relate to each other on a couple of axes there. My favorite is actually this table from the Wikipedia article on emotion classification. Uh, let's drill into one of these. So let's say I'm feeling angry, and I can go through this and say, am I feeling rage? No, not rage. Disgust? Nope. Irritable? Yeah, that's close. Okay, sure. Then I can drill into irritable and discover I'm feeling grumpy. I like this tree a lot for finding new emotional vocabulary words. Cross patch I've never used. I think that might be British. I'm curious. All right, so uh, that was emotional vocabulary. Expanding that, having more nuanced speech can help you understand yourself. Technique two is to talk to a friend. This is my favorite technique. I love doing this. When you talk to a friend, you have to put your experience into words so that it can convey to the other person in the first place. Uh, they also help you realize if you're speaking clearly, if you're enunciating and articulating your experience in a way someone else can understand, and that's helpful. And sometimes they even can tell you ways they are interpreting what you're saying, so you can refine how you're describing it and how you understand it. It's huge. Uh, they can also validate you and say your experience makes sense to me, but we'll come back to that at the validation section. If you don't have a friend handy, you might want to talk to a duck, <laughs> a rubber duck. This is a common programming trick. So let's say you're working on a, a hard work problem and you might want to talk to a coworker, but you're not sure if anyone's available. You could try to explain the situation to a duck and give them all the context they need to catch up to where you're at to troubleshoot it with you. And by the time you enunciate the whole problem, you might discover you don't need to talk to the coworker at all, because by articulating it, you've come to your own answer. I end up doing this a lot in the form of I'm Slack messaging a coworker, and then I delete it completely. So if you ever see me, Casey is typing, and then I stop. Maybe I solved my own problem. I didn't have to message you. Uh, it applies to experience processing, too. You can talk to a plant or a pet, like a cat or a dog, and talk to them, even if they can't respond to you. Just by articulating it out loud and hearing your own voice in the air, you might get deeper. All right, next technique is writing, journaling. And I don't necessarily mean a journal by your bedside table. I mean writing your thoughts and feelings somewhere. I often open a Gmail draft just because that's the quickest opening text editor I have. 
word and Google Docs are so much slower. Uh, when you journal, not only do you have to put your thoughts and feelings into words, you also have the chance to reread them and edit them if you want to be more accurate or explain it more clearly. Journaling is super powerful. All right, next one. Reading fiction is really helpful to get you better at the general skill of it, uh, because when an author wants to convey a character's thoughts and feelings to you, they have to put it into words. <laughs> and hopefully they use uh, accurate, understandable words that convey exactly how the character is thinking and feeling. Uh, so you, you get a lot of good examples of that. Uh, one of the words in psychology research around reading fiction is emotional transportation, where if you identify with the character a lot on a deep level, then you like learn things about other people, you get maybe better at empathy, it correlates with a bunch of things. Anyway, fiction is useful. If you've written it off as a not useful uh, way to spend your time, consider it again. Uh, maybe even the top 20 books of last year would be a good place to start, because I imagine if they're popular, they probably have some emotional transportation. All right, last technique here is meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation. And this is particularly good at getting you uh, uh, comfortable viewing your emotions as data. So your, your automatic thoughts and your automatic feelings, to not judge them and just to get comfortable with those as inputs. That's one of the focuses of mindfulness here. All right, those are the six processing techniques to help you work through your problems. Uh, I, I find it difficult to think of them when I need them sometimes, and so I find a reference like this really helpful. I wrote out a bunch of the ideas on this Google Doc, which you can download, make a copy of, uh, including those six techniques we just talked about. The next section is about validation. Right, validation is the recognition and acceptance of another person's experience as understandable. The key word there is understandable, to say that it makes sense. And you can do this whether or not you agree with what their conclusion is. If you can just say, if I believed X, then Y would make sense to me, that's validating. You're like, you're like with them through that thought process. My favorite way to think about validating a friend who wants support is through the six levels of validation. Uh, I have the six named out on the right, and then I kind of grouped them on the left here. We'll go through these. Um, one is about being available, two are about verbalizing, like we did before a little bit, and three are about making sense, telling them that they make sense. All right, the first one, being present. So you can make someone feel validated by just being with them. If you just sit with them while they're sad or upset or frustrated, not you don't have to say anything. Even just your presence is helpful. Uh, in the this time period we're in, uh, phone calls, video calls, or even texting can also be a form of presence that makes someone feel comforted. Uh, oh, by the way, the validation levels here go from be present is the lowest one, and radical genuineness is the highest one in terms of its potential impact. But you can't always do the highest one. Sometimes being present is all you can do, and that's okay. So this is a, a range, this is a tool belt. You can use these in different situations. It's good to have all six available. All right, so number two. Sometimes you can do better than just sitting with them. If they're telling you how they are thinking and feeling, their experience, you can reflect back to them. It sounds like you're feeling this and you're thinking that. Uh, at the extreme, I think of a caricature of a therapist that just echoes back everything you say, just parroting, and that's not super helpful. It's something. It's it's good, but you can do better, and that's what the other levels are going to be for. All right, so just um, saying it back to them is helpful and better than just sitting with them. The third level here is to carefully guess at their unstated feelings. This is like exploring how to explain it with them. Uh, it can be really validating to guess correctly, but you could also guess incorrectly and invalidate them, which is dangerous. It's hard to do this very effectively. Uh, and you can't do this with everybody. You can't necessarily get this comfortable with someone 
Uh, but hopefully you can with your closer friends. I, I believe if you work on it with them and if they're open to it, you probably can develop it, but it's hard. The key here is to leave plenty of room for correction so that they feel like they can correct any guesses that you make that aren't quite right. Uh, and again, like you might not be able to do this with everyone, so caveats aplenty. I have two different tools you can use to make space for correction, to make space for them to feel comfortable correcting you. The first one is the open-closed spectrum. So an open-ended question is one where uh, it's open for any answer the person wants to give. And at the farther end, the closed at the bottom is not even a question, it's just a statement. So for them to correct that, the last one, that is so unfair for them to correct that, they would have to say no, and like completely stop the statement that you had in the air and like shift gears. It's so much easier for them to correct you for the open one. What did that feel like? They just share what they felt like. I often reach for ones in the middle though, so let's say if I have an idea that it might have been unfair, did that feel unfair? And they could very easily correct that if it wasn't quite right. But I'm still like giving them something. I'm thinking about it with them, I'm guessing with them how it might have felt. I use the full range, but uh, often something in the middle is pretty powerful. Uh, my second tool here is the confidence level spectrum. So if I have high confidence, I can say something like must have. Uh, and if I don't know, Maybe I don't even say it all. It's a very open-ended uh, question kind of thing. How did you feel? I can't imagine that. I have such low confidence that I'm not even going to suggest something. And in the middle, sometimes I say, like, I imagine or I guess that might have felt a certain way. Uh, so that's a way to do it without questions, necessarily. But there's still room for correction. It can be helpful if you, I mean, you might think, OK, so if I want to be very correctable, I should always just ask open-ended questions. But it can be really validating to, for someone to guess correctly. So like, if you can safely do that and they can safely correct you, it's helpful to, to be able to say sometimes, that's unfair. I'm sure you can imagine a time a friend agreed with you strongly like that and it was right, and it felt pretty good. So this whole range is there for you to use. Whew. That was guessing. Uh, guessing unstated feelings. Next up, these are the three, four, five, and six are the three that are about saying, that makes sense. So four here, validating based on their past. Uh, the example I like to use is I had a friend growing up who was afraid of my pet dogs. I had two sweet dogs that just loved to be pet all the time. They liked cuddles and affection, but he was afraid of them. Uh, and I eventually figured out he was attacked by a dog as a kid when he was even younger. Is of course he would be afraid of dogs, even if he doesn't want to be, even if he believes my dogs are, are safe and cuddly, he still might not want to. And that makes sense. Ah, do you see that? It makes sense that he would feel that way based on his past. But if we're walking past a dog on the street that's snarling, trying to defend someone's front yard, uh, I could do even better than just saying, it makes sense you're afraid of that snarling dog based on your past. I could say anyone would be afraid of that dog. It looks like it's trying to protect its area. It doesn't It doesn't want us here. Anyone would be afraid of the snarling dog. Uh, so you can do a little bit better than just based on your past. This surprised me because I thought the more personal answer is generally better. It's like pointing out that I know his history with dogs might be supportive. But this, when I've tried it, actually did make people feel even better than uh, the personal one. Anyway, these are all tools in your tool belt, and you can apply them as makes sense. Whew, that seems like a lot. That's almost everything, right? What could six possibly be? Radical genuineness is the term for this one. This is like if you have the same experience or similar, very similar experience to one that someone else is going through, and you can relate to it very deeply. Uh, so with the dog example, I guess if I had been attacked by a dog as a kid, maybe I would feel the same, and I could relate to that a lot. Uh, or for a more extreme example, if you had a parent pass away and someone else had a child pass away, uh, I mean, you can relate to family death some amount, but the tricky part with this is the other person has to believe your experience is very related or it doesn't quite work. It can invalidate them. Say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. If they don't believe it, that could be counterproductive. Uh, so the key for this to share your experiences that relate to theirs is to make sure they think it agrees and uh, it relates, 
and that they are open to hearing it. And often you need to go through the other levels first to get on the same page for this to be helpful. But if you can, this can be the most powerful of all. Whew, it's a lot about validation. This uh, is another thing that I don't expect you to memorize based on what I just said, so you might want the reference for these. Just list the six out. Whew, I love talking about validation. <laughs> but anyway, switching gears, next up is cognitive restructuring. That's the process of correcting cognitive distortions. There are some thought patterns that are just counterproductive, they get in the way. This graphic has 10 of the most common ones. We'll go through some examples uh, to look at these. So for the scenario I shared earlier, I was going to a meetup, I was hangry and wet and late and I stepped in a puddle and I thought lots of bad things to myself, lots of negative thoughts. Well, here's one of them. Wet shoes are the worst, I heard myself snarl to myself. And then I went whoop, and I thought about it, and I said, all right, that statement doesn't seem quite right. It's not quite true. Uh, and identified that it was uh, magnification that I was doing here. Magnification, I was blowing it out of proportion. Not only is it uncomfortable, and I'm not in a good, happy state right now, uh, it's also the worst. I'm like really blowing it out of proportion. All right, second thought. If I'm late, I shouldn't even go. I thought that. I thought about not going because I was running late. And I noticed, ah, that seems like all or nothing thinking. It's black and white thinking. Uh, it's like it's not acceptable to do the thing in the middle for some reason. And I thought about it. People go late sometimes. It's always fine. I never even really notice. It's not like such a big faux pas. So I'm glad I caught that because I would believed my automatic thought I might not have gone. I heard myself say this too. Today sucks. Whew, this is a doozy. It's got a bunch. For one, it's overgeneralizing the whole day. It's also disqualifying all the positive things that happened to me earlier that day. I had a great latte that morning, I'm sure. So not the entire day sucked. It's also jumping, uh, or I guess fortune telling is a subtype of this. It was predicting the future, the rest of the day wouldn't be good either. Which I didn't know. What I did know is that I was in a bad state right then, being hangry and wet and late. All right, so to counter on the left, those original thoughts that we just went through, what shoes are the worst? and late I shouldn't go, and today sucks, I can counter those kinds of thoughts that I noticed had cognitive distortions going on with some more adaptive thoughts I have on the right. I said, I am feeling frustrated. That wasn't so cathartic to say to myself, but it stopped me from downward spiraling, <laughs> which was my goal here anyway. I told myself, it's okay to go late, people do it all the time, and today can get better. I wanted to say today will get better, but I, I did what I could. <laughs> I countered what I could. Uh, this list of 10 is super useful. I suggest you print it. Uh, there's a link to it from the notes too. Uh, I also list it in my handout. Although I like their icons a lot. All right, time for the summary. You're just whirlwinded through a ton of concepts. Let's review. Uh, oh yeah, for, first of all, the all the big concepts are in this handout, if you'd like to get that. I'm just going to, uh, I'm mostly going to review the techniques. Yeah, we'll just do that. So the first technique you learn about going whoop to switch gears into your mindful state. You learned about a list of different types of input that you can think through to take stock of what's going on once you're in that whoop state. We covered six processing techniques that you can pull out as needed. Covered the six levels of validation, which I imagine is new to a lot of people. It's not discussed too much, and I wish it was. Uh, we also touched on some of the 10 most common maladaptive thought patterns, those cognitive distortions, and how to counter them with other thoughts. I want to call out some other tools you can reach out for if you're interested. Uh, first of all, a therapist is like a brain trainer. They can train you on all of these ideas and more. Whether or not you have a mental illness, uh, this is just their specialty. I mean, most people have an amount of anxiety, whether it's clinical or not. Uh, anyway, and therapists also do screenings if you just want to get screened to see if this, this approach would be helpful, any of these. 
Uh, another tool is the CBT book. The one that popularized it is called Feeling Good by David Burns. That one has a ton of examples. It goes into the cognitive distortions in depth. Uh, it's super thorough. But it's, it's a little long and dense, so that's one if you really want to dig into it. The reason I wrote my book, uh, which is similar, is because I wanted a really short version that was concise to cover all the big ideas. So plug for my book. Mine is super short and digestible. Like That was my main goal when writing it. I think it's a good overview, and then you can dig into other resources from there. There's also two apps, or two types of apps I want to call out. One is a meditation app. Headspace is a popular one. Calm is another one. And they can take you through not judging your thoughts and just being sitting with your inputs and being aware of them. Another app is if you have social anxiety, or if that term feels relatable, whether or not you have it, there's an app for that called Joyable that I've had some friends use that they had some success. A lot of it is going through cognitive distortions and like it gives you some prompts to answer at certain times. I like that structure. I wish there was something like that for general CBT and not just social anxiety, but I haven't found it yet. If you find it, let me know. Oh yeah, I have to plug my book. I even made it an audiobook. I'm very proud. It was fun to narrate my own book. All right, if there are questions in the sidebar, since this is pre-recorded, I can't answer them by voice, but I'll be in the chat. Let me know. All right, thank you all. Hope you learned a lot.